Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. There are many signs of the coming of Christ that are given in this particular chapter. And I know that as we look at these signs of the time, we know that uh, would not violate any Bible prophecy should Jesus come today. But I want us to pay particular attention to a statement that's made in verse 12. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. And the question that I want us to consider tonight is, what is happening to love? What is happening to love? As we consider what Jesus said here, first of all, he said, because of iniquity abounding, and we see iniquity abounding on every hand as we look around, and uh, of course, the daily newspaper is something that's uh, soon to uh, come to an end, and uh, that... Uh, there are many printed forms of news that uh, will soon come to an end and that uh, you have to get it off of the internet. And so as you listen to the news on uh, television or on the radio or uh, even the app on your phone, that you'll see that iniquity indeed is abounding. And... Uh, you hear reports about uh, cities not far removed from this place, cities around 150 miles away as being the most dangerous city in the United States. And uh, then Mobile is not a real safe place anymore. And there are certain places around this town that you have to be careful when you go into because of, of uh, different situations that exist in different parts of the city. And so this is becoming a very widespread phenomenon. And as a result, that uh, scripture is indeed fulfilling itself. And then he said, because iniquity is abounding, that the love of many shall wax cold. Now, I know that we're <clears throat> just a few days away from Christmas. And that Christmas is still being celebrated in many of the parts of the world today, uh, particularly here in the United States. And uh, I hear that in some nations, in fact, I read a report the other day that uh, they've stopped celebrating Christmas. And uh, that many of the children are growing up now uh, don't know about Christmas. And uh, that some, uh, that many children... If they've heard of Christmas, they don't know the reason behind Christmas. And that's sad to me. But iniquity or lawlessness, evil, is abounding in the world today. In the 127th uh, Psalm, we're going to uh, refer to in, in just a moment. But as I think about the children that do not have the opportunity that that we had when we were children, that our children have now, and I trust that our children's children will have the same opportunity that, that we have to hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And many beautiful uh, sanctuaries are sitting empty tonight because uh, people uh, are not willing to go uh, to the house of the Lord don't have a desire to go to the house of the Lord, and I'm going to get to that a little bit later on in, in the message tonight. But I think about the overall general conditions that exist today, that they're not those conditions that uh, your dedicated, faithful child of God enjoy. They're conditions that grieve us at our heart because we're living in grievous times. And as a result, that uh, we know the coming of the Lord is, is drawing nigh. So tonight I'd like for us to think about that love is waxing cold for many of the reasons that I'm going to mention tonight. And of course, this is not a, 
a complete list by any means, but yet it can help us to see and understand why that love is waxing cold. Now, love of parents for their children is waxing cold in the day in which we live. In the 127th Psalm, in verse 3, the psalmist tells us, Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord. That is, they're a blessing of the Lord. And, of course, they're given to us by the Lord. And it talks about uh, how blessed a man is who has his quiver full of them. And we know that uh, today that uh, I read stories about that uh, our population is declining in the United States. Children or people aren't having uh, children uh, in the proportions that uh, they once did. And I never thought I'd live to see that day because they used to talk about that uh, one would be able, be able to, uh, to feed the population in the years to come. And so the birth rate is declining in the United States today. And if children are heritage of the Lord, that means that God gives them to us uh, to bless our hearts. And so as we think about our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren and those who follow after us, and you go back in the Bible and you read about great men and women of God who were great <clears throat> inspirations to their uh, those who followed them in this life and that they uh, sought to guide them. Even uh, you read about uh, uh, cases where uncles uh, were a blessing to their nephews and so on. And uh, I've had some uncles along the way that were a real blessing to my heart and it touched my life. And you may have too, or aunts or grandmothers and so on who are a special blessing to you in this life. But when I think about children being a heritage of the Lord and I think about parents not loving their children as, as they should, to the Christian parent, we're told in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4 to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And this means that we're to bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And when I hear children who uh, tell me or ask the question, well, who was Jesus? I wonder what kind of parents do they have that they don't even know who Jesus is. And he said to bring them up both in the nurture and in the admonition of the Lord. Today, we see much child abuse. You hear about it uh, very often. Fathers and mothers abusing their children, abandoning their children. You know, here several years ago when the lady uh, put her children in the car and uh, ran off in the lake purposely to uh, kill both them and, and her, uh, you know, you wonder... What's going on in the mind and heart of an individual who do that? And you say, well, they were sick. But why, oh, why would you be blessed with children to kill those children? I was watching a documentary the other night uh, when I was sick and in bed and uh, on a, on a video that uh, had been sent to the house. And uh, it was about these missionaries that would fly into these remote areas of the world. And uh, when they showed those little land landing strips that they landed on, I thought, no way can they be able to land an airplane on that little landing strip on the side of the mountain. But every one of them made the statement that they felt like that's what God had called them to do. It was an organization that started back at the end of World War II. Uh, pilots that served in the Army Air Corps in World War II, Christian pilots that uh, they would take planes that uh, had been put up for scrap by the armed services and they'd fly into remote areas and take Bibles and Sunday school literature and food 
the people and try to convert them to the Lord. And uh, it showed what a blessing it was to take these, to, uh, to, uh, these people. And they interviewed one man who was the tribal leader in this one village. And he was explaining that years ago that if someone became sick or, or desperately ill in the community that they put tea leaves on the ball. And depending upon uh, what happened to those tea leaves, would, uh, it would guide them to the person who had the evil spirits that caused their loved ones to be sick and the village would go out and kill that person because they thought evil spirits were bringing on either sickness or death. And tears began to flow down his cheeks and he said, and I'm so thankful that God sent these missionaries to us to help us to understand that people get sick because they eat bad food. They get sick because uh, something's in the air that they take. They don't get sick because someone has evil spirits. And, and, and I thought about uh, the love that, that he had for his village and he learned to speak English so he could uh, read, uh, read the Bible uh, to his fellow villagers and then go over to a neighboring uh, village and, and take the gospel to them. And, and how much they seemed to love those children that lived in, in those little villages and how much uh, that uh, they were a blessing to them. And so there needs to be greater love in many instances for uh, parents for their children. Then there needs to be a greater love of children for their parents. Parents are not disposable items. You know, you, you can go to the store and buy something in a cardboard box and uh, you can dispose of that box if you're so inclined to do. You can send it to the recyclers or you can put it in a uh, trash can or you can uh, burn it in a pit. In other words, you can dispose of it because it's disposable. <coughs> but when mother and dad get old, you can't just go throw them on the trash heap and forget about them. And I know that there, there are uh, situations, there are occasions where uh, a parent gets so ill and, and has so many problems that they need constant medical care. And in that case, well, then maybe they need to go into a nursing home so they could receive that round-the-clock care by medical professionals. But just forsaking parents, and you'd be surprised down through the years of my ministry how many times I've walked into nursing homes and I've had parents to tell me, and you say, well, they, they probably were out of their mind, didn't know what they were talking about. I'm talking about people with good minds. And they'd tell me, well, you know, my children hardly ever come to see me. So I might see them at Thanksgiving or maybe at Christmas or maybe on my birthday. But other than that, I don't see them. And, and you wonder, you know, that parent who took the time to invest in that child why that child would, for all practical purposes, abandon that parent. It's often been said, once a man and twice a child. And sometimes that's the case. You know, the time may come when I won't know who I am. The time may come when I won't know who you are. I won't know who my wife is. Well, somebody's going to have to take me by the hand and lead me around to places I don't want to go. <laughs> and the scripture talks about that. Solomon spoke of that. There's going to come a time when the grinders are going to cease because there are few. That is because my teeth going to fall out. There'll come a time when we're afraid of heights. I've already reached that place. You're not going to get me up on a roof anymore. And many different things that, that happen to us as, as the aging process sets in. <coughs> I 
But children need to continue to love their parents. In the sixth chapter of the book of Ephesians, in verses 2 and 3, I want us to turn and read. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment. And he goes on to say, with promise. Now, what is that promise? And he explains that promise to us in the next verse. That it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. So the promise is that you may live a longer life if you'll be good to your parents. You know the way some children treat their parents, I, I just stand off and I say, well, I wonder if their life will be short because of the way that they treat their parents. They don't show love and, and respect for them as they should. You know, I, I thought about, I've heard children on up in age, I'm talking about 70, 80 years of age, say, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, yes, sir, and no, sir, to their aged parents. When they have grandchildren, maybe even great-grandchildren of their own, but they still respect that mother and that dad. And that's what the Bible tells us to do, that our life may be long upon this earth. Then, there's a matter of the failure of love on the part of society for human life. And I'm so thankful when the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade made it possible for this decision to go back to the individual states. And actually, the way the Constitution is written, that's the way it should be. That the individual states should decide uh, the laws for their uh, individual states, and uh, as long as it doesn't conflict with the rights of others. And uh, so there's this big hubbub now about... Uh, Certain ones in Congress and the president are trying to get a, an, another bill passed uh, to make abortion legal again. Well, if it goes for the Supreme Court, they'll just overturn it again. It's what's going to happen with the conservative Supreme Court. And I'm not up here on the stump tonight preaching politics. But <clears throat> what I'm saying is this. The utter disregard for life. I heard a young lady on the radio the other day. People had tried to encourage her. She uh, was having an unexpected baby. And people were encouraging her to get an abortion. And a caring Christian nurse carried her in and went over the, what do you call it, sonogram, uh, with her. And she said, when I saw that baby's legs moving, when I saw that baby's arms moving, she said, it instantly changed my mind. She said, that's a real life growing inside me. And I can't take that life. Well, I wonder why more people don't feel that way. Utter disregard for human life. Next month, the month of January, <clears throat> is Sanctity of Life Month. What does life really mean to us? And I've read stories, and, and you have as well, uh, surrounding the First World War. And I've even read some stories concerning the Civil War. I uh, saw a story the other day during the Civil War that uh, they were on the battlefield and uh, that... Uh, the, they laid down their arms on Christmas Day. And they joined together and had a joint meal. The Rebs and the Union soldiers. And then they got out and they played softball in the afternoon. And you know, if they could lay down their arms and participate in a joint Christmas dinner and get out and play softball... 
Why couldn't they lay down those arms for good? Why is it that we have to see things such as are going on in the Ukraine today? Utter disregard for human life. When hospitals and apartment buildings are being bombed, schools, innocent children being killed. In First Timothy or Second Timothy, rather, chapter three and verse three, we're told in the last days that men would be without natural affection. Well. <clears throat> What is it that about man's inhumanity to man that pricks at our heart? I've had, and you may say, and you, you may say that I'm I'm foolish for thinking this. And that's your right to do so. But. I don't know if I could survive very long if I took a human life. And I don't understand how that in the halls of a hospital, that in one room a doctor is taking a baby's precious life. And then maybe on the next floor, a doctor's delivering a baby to a proud new mother and dad. Sonograms are not always accurate. I know that my wife has shared this story with me many times. When her mother was carrying her, she took German measles. And that was something that normally would cause all sorts of debilitating problems with a baby when it was born. It could be born blind, it could be born deaf, it could be born without limbs, all sorts of things that could happen to that baby as a result of just having the measles. And my mother-in-law's doctor told her as she had the measles, she, he, he, he sat her down. He told her about all these things that could possibly be wrong with the baby. And he said, now, we can abort this baby and avoid all that. And she said, no, sir. God, if you knew my, if you'd known my mother-in-law, you could appreciate this. She was a soft-spoken little lady. She was five feet three tall, a little short lady. But she loved the Lord with all her heart. And she said, I believe the Lord will take care of you. I've been married to a woman almost 50 years now that the doctor wanted to abort. I'm so thankful that my mother-in-law said, no, we're not going to do that. My sister, the same thing happened with my mother. My mother had a problem bearing children into this world. There would have been five of us had we all lived. But it turned out there were only two of us. She had three miscarriages. And <clears throat> when my only surviving sister, when she was expecting her, she had German measles, my mother. The doctor set her down, told her the same thing that my mother-in-law's doctor had told her. My mother's response was the same. No, I'm not having an abortion. I believe the Lord's able to take care of this thing. And the only thing that I can determine that really affected her was her eyesight. She's not blind, but she was able to go on to study to be a nurse. Worked many years as a nurse and retired from being a nurse. Well, what would have happened if my mother... My mother-in-law had had abortions. There had been two people 
who had never existed in this life. So what has happened to society that the love for human life is not what it should be? Then there's a matter of the love for God and his church. We're to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. As God commanded Israel. But we're told in the second chapter of the book of 2 Thessalonians that before the day of the Lord comes, that there's going to come a falling away first. Brothers and sisters, I believe that we've lived to see that falling away. And it came in a way that I never suspected that it would come. But nevertheless, it's here. So the great falling away is taking place. And, and child of God, and I'm thankful to those who are faithful to be here in the service tonight. But if you're a child of God, and you're not faithful to God, to his cause, to his church, then... <clears throat> And you say that you love God. Do you, are you not misspeaking? You're proving by your actions that you love yourself more than God. When I visit with people, and of course the last several years I haven't been able to do a whole lot of visiting due to people not wanting you to come in their home because of the COVID situation. But <clears throat> here's one of the things that I hear. I've made a lot of phone calls. I've sent a lot of texts and cards the last couple of years. Here's one of the things that I'm finding out is that people are using excuses to not be faithful to God. And you notice I use the term excuses rather than reasons. Well, preacher, we'll, we'll come back to church when COVID's over. You know what the doctor told me last week? He said this thing could go on forever. I was kind of amused. I went to the urgent care and the nurse came in and took my blood pressure and temperature and all that and asked me a bunch of questions. And then the PA came in. She asked me a bunch of questions. I told her, I said, this is the third time I've had this. Is there any end to it? She said, I've had it three times also. When the doctor came in, he said, oh yeah. I said, you can have it every time you're exposed to it. Whether you've had the shots or not. I didn't say it, but I thought, well, you know how to make a fella feel good. Come try to get a little encouragement. And you give me discouragement in place of encouragement. But he was just being truthful. But <clears throat> if we love the things that we do more than we love God, our priorities are in the wrong order if we're a child of God. Sinner, God loves you. Jesus died for you. And he did it for one reason. You know, this time of the year, as we celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, it also would be advantageous to us to not only remember his birth, but also remember what he's done for us, not only in his birth, but in his life, in his cruel death, in his death, his crucifixion, his coming again. You know, we see this little scene up here of the baby Jesus lying in a manger. 
Joseph, Mary. That's what we think about. We think about Christmas. But then, what about our personal relationship with him? You know, I asked, I believe, a question uh, the last Sunday that I was here before I got sick. Have you finished your Christmas shopping? I still haven't finished mine. And I read today that uh, the other department stores are ordering online. You better get done by tomorrow. Tomorrow's the last day. If you want to get it before Christmas. Well, we may have some loose ends to tie up before Christmas. Well, I was talking about the other day. Here it is right at Christmas time. Both of us are sick. Well, the Lord's blessed us to get better. Hopefully we'll be able to enjoy family coming in and so on and celebrate Christmas. But Jesus <clears throat> left the splendor of heaven and came to this world for one reason and one reason only. And it's defined by the term love. Have you experienced his love? Have you received him as Lord and Savior? The bulk of the message tonight has been concerning what is happening to love. The love of mankind may fade away. The love of man may turn to hatred and abandonment. But God's love is an everlasting love. Would you experience his everlasting love tonight? I'm going to ask for a verse of invitation hymn. Anything be on your heart, you come as we stand and sing. <clears throat>